Delighted to have with us Paul Barth and Chad Dow, uh, one of his clients. So Paul, take it away. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tony. I do appreciate it. Uh, I think part of that introduction is important because I come from the data space, 25 years of helping large companies build enterprise platforms for accelerating analytics and improving their business performance. And the tools of the trade that myself and my uh, co-founders of my company pioneered were around data warehousing. And uh, as you've been hearing in this morning's keynotes, um, the evolution uh, of the need for data, the use of analytics, and the infrastructure for how to deal with data has been uh, undergoing a severe transformation. And so these days, uh, I run a, uh, a, a software company out of Boston that has a product that helps companies use Hadoop, an enterprise data lake, to accelerate their analytics processes. Uh, with me today, who's going to do most of the speaking, uh, is Chad Dow, who first became a customer of ours when he was running U.S. commercial analytics for Astellas Pharmaceuticals and has made a huge transition off of a, a Natiza data warehouse, a very powerful appliance platform, onto a data lake managed by Podium and has had a lot of success. And so I think what he wants to share with you are lessons learned, what the tangible business benefits are, some of the risk factors, uh, because there, there's a lot to it. But I, I do want to take just a moment to um, share with you a little bit about what we're seeing as the evolution in the space. So we use the term data lake because everyone understands the term data lake. But I want data professionals to start thinking about a data lake a very different way. We like to use the term marketplace, thinking about it as a marketplace where providers or producers of data are bringing data in without really knowing how it's going to be used. They, they kind of have raw material. And this Hadoop economics allows you to bring it all in and refresh it and have a repository available for use by business consumers and other consumers um, uh, over time, drawing off of that raw material. So the, 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 the methods of going and getting extract files and doing data modeling before you loaded your first byte have been fundamentally disrupted by this. The second thing that's happened is that the consumers are, yes, knowledge workers and analytics groups, but they're also system feeds, system services, and algorithms increasingly. So as we see the IoT popping up, I think uh, data lakes are going to help um, with the exchange of information between devices and algorithms and actions like we saw in the AI talk. And uh, what we're seeing also is this shift of power from the producers of the data, which was traditionally IT and the systems owners, to the consumers who are saying, I can make value out of that data. I want access to it. And increasingly, they want self-service. And this kind of usually gives shudders to folks who come from a warehousing background and saying, you don't, you don't know what you're dealing with. This is raw data. This is a dupe. And what we found is that there's a tremendous opportunity for this new uh, kind of paradigm, but it's going to take some time uh, and some new technologies like the product that we've created, Podium, to help enterprises manage that. Uh, and what this, the result is, data is going to be ready for consumers on demand. Um, and the power moves from producers to consumers, as I said. But one of the things I like about this, this uh, approach of consolidating data on a low-cost, high-power platform is network effect economics, that if you manage this well, Adding new data to the data lake may be a little painful at first, but the more people who add it, the more benefit everyone gets. Because when I add in my new transaction, set of transactions, and the CRM data is already there, the CRM people benefit from my trans transactions, and I don't have to load that other data and duplicate. So the way we think about enterprise data management is the data management process really is covering uh, what we call the first mile of data. That is from a state of raw data coming off the wire, coming out of systems, all the way through a life cycle of being ready for use. And that might look like traditional ETL, but in fact, there are a lot of factors that make it different. But in the end of the day, we believe that supporting uh, both data developers, IT, and the business uh, users in sourcing data from different systems, bringing it in, making it usable, securing it, allowing self-service discovery and self-service preparation, and then allowing that to be consumed by traditional tools, 
commercial and open source tools that are out there makes for a very viable role in the ecosystem. The other thing you're gonna see here is that this is a management application that talks to Hadoop. It's not a uh, raw Hadoop and it's also not its own walled in garden with its proprietary data format. So we're leveraging this, wa this uh, wave of open source software development and taking advantage of all the innovation that's going in there but putting security control structure governance on top of it. So the way we think about this and the way it um, can materialize is that instead of building a, you know, designing your target like we used to with the warehouses and bringing in data en masse and mapping it and then releasing it, we're in a much more agile environment. And that is why we need to think about data in a slightly different way. First of all, we might want to think of tiers of data. And we call those data as bronze, silver, and gold, which is where we came up with the name for Podium. Bronze data is raw data. It's generally in the same format, certainly unchanged values from the systems it came from. And that's great because you know, and it's usually all of the data. So one thing that's nice is you don't go to the data lake and say, oh, we forgot to load the, these two tables or these seven columns. All the data is there. And, it's, and it means you can drive your user communities to go to the data lake and say, well, it may not be ready for you to consume yet, but at least you don't have to go back to that source system and ask for another extract. Silver, I'm going to jump to gold. Gold is what we used to think about in terms of master data management and data warehouses. This is what we want our data to look like. And we engineered a lot of mapping and cleansing to get it there. Um, and we think that's a very important thing to evolve and have in the data lake as well that reference data, et cetera. But we added in this concept of a silver layer, which is fit for purpose. And when uh, Chad talks about his data lake, one of the things that you'll learn is that that middle layer they call the subject area data set is not really a data warehouse model, and it's, but it's much cleaner and better organized than the raw data. It's something in between. And this is what we're finding is that there's good, useful production quality data sets that are evolving and being developed uh, in these environments. And sometimes they're for a quick ad hoc query, and sometimes they actually meet a longer term need. And that there is a natural opportunity here for evolution from bronze to silver to gold over time. And what you see in the actors on the right hand side, the different personas, is that some of your users actually should never touch the data lake. They should just consume the gold data, maybe out on a relational platform. Um, then there are other analysts and uh, data experts who can work with creating silver out of uh, bronze data, or they can stitch together a new view from all three layers. So this idea of data of different quality on one platform, accessible, metadata driven, and secured so only the right people with the right permissions have access to it is incredibly empowering because it turns from a black and white, no, you can't get that data, or yes, you can, it's ready for full production enterprise-wide, into a more granular and nuanced discussion, which means you can deliver more value, and in fact, you can engage the consumer community in the identification of data quality issues and the definitions and specifications of what they really want. Because I think at the end of the day, what has always hurt us as data professionals is that those business users never give us really good requirements. And the reality is we don't get them because nobody knows the business requirements. They're constantly changing, the market's changing, the needs change. So we designed this and used this Hadoop technology to keep up with the change. And final words I'll say before I hand this over to Chad was just summarizing some of their use cases. That is, this is not a, a dot-com startup with you know, petabytes of clickstream data. This started out really with commercial analytics, sales and marketing, structured data largely, with the idea that uh, we would go to unstructured over time. And the challenge was that, the, 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 I remember the day Chad said, I have seven terabytes of clinical data on my, under my desk and I want to get it in the warehouse. And they said, it's going to take me six months and a million dollars. And I really want more self-service. We have skilled data professionals. We have a couple data scientists. And we can do this without having to use this entire warehouse mechanism, which is a little slow. And, and uh, this is a story I've heard over and over and over again. It's a story I heard before big data came around to commercial use. 
It's always been a frustration. Uh, and so I said, well, what technical options might we have? And uh, Chad considered uh, custom building it with uh, some partners and consulting partners uh, and looked at Podium as well and chose that two years ago. And we've been in production since. And one of the reasons we were chosen is that we built in a lot of automation to make Hadoop easy. In fact, to date, Chad and his team have not hired one Hadoop programmer, and they're rolling this out globally. So this is becoming a standard platform to support a lot of the business, and they have not because of Podium's ability to manage the data automatically and build a true data layer, data as a service, not had to become Hadoop programmers. Um, and that we were able to scale very quickly. You initially had, I think, five terabytes on. You were able to bring in that clinical data, and they'll build a lot of views that within under a year was up to 50 terabytes of data. So agility, the ability to build out with his team the bronze and silver and gold layers very quickly and manage it with security, field level protection of PII data and those kinds of things was already important. And I'd say that you know the, the, the net out of this is more agility, uh, more ability to do more analyses with the same, uh, with, this, with a small group of people, and then incorporate data and analytics into the business. And so just like our first speaker said, I think that's how you have to measure success. Did we actually move the needle on the business, not just did we get the technology working? So with that said, I'll hand it over to Chad. Thank you very much. So a little bit about where I am now. Uh, yes, I was in US commercial. Uh, I've moved into a global role where I manage uh, real world informatics across uh, all four of our regions. Uh, we are managing a global system. Um, the internal team that we manage it with is literally probably 10% of my time and one headcount. So uh, roughly 150 terabytes uh, managed by one person and a few uh, consultants. So the reason we uh, started down this path is, as, as Paul was saying, and he's not exaggerating, I did have 17 terabytes under my desk. Uh, and beyond my office getting really warm, um, it obviously isn't the best solution for uh, how we were uh, doing things. Uh, the reason we were, I was doing this is, you know, we had a lot of large data sets. That was a high cost to get them loaded into IS. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of big data, no, we're not a bank. It's not huge. It's not uh, big. But a lot of the calculations we are doing are uh, nonlinear and parametric. And uh, the calculations do get quite large on the analytics side. Uh, the other thing is we are working for marketing sales. For those of you who have worked with marketing and sales in the past, uh, they won everything yesterday. Uh, giving them a six month time frame and saying I'll get this analytics or this type of data to you in six months, it's just not going to happen. They're not going to want it in a month, much less six months. So we did look at other solutions. We looked at the on-prem uh, solution we already had. Uh, we also looked at uh, trying to brute force it out with uh, just uh, adding additional staff. Uh, and where we finally landed was uh, building out of Data Lake. So one of the most difficult things, uh, I will say, uh, both now and as we're building it out, uh, was internal politics. Uh, I sit on the business side. Uh, I now manage my own uh, IS staff as well as uh, an analytics team for commercial analytics globally. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges we have and continue to have is you know, who really owns the data. You know, our perspective is that if there's not a reason that I shouldn't give it to you, you should have access to it. And I think that's very different than uh, the traditional IS uh, paradigm. So we learned a lot going through this process and uh, had a lot of uh, lessons learned. Um, hosting, uh, we went through two to three hosting vendors before we landed on one that really worked well. Uh, we ran into situations where uh, servers were up or down and we couldn't get them turned back on. Uh, and that can really you know, derail your project. Um, security, um, I'll give you an example uh, from the last few days that some of the challenges we had. Uh, right now I manage across medical and commercial. Um, originally we were allowing uh, some degree of flow of information between the two. Uh, based on compliance, I was asked to split them so that commercial can never see what medical is doing uh, and implement it within a week. And these are kind of the challenges that we've faced uh, within uh, security and setting that up and being able to adjust uh, more agilely. Uh, data growth, um, 
as Paul was saying, we started with about 17 terabytes. Uh, we're up between 150 and 200 now. Um, and one of the biggest challenges we have is everybody wants to put their data in, whether that's medical affairs, um, clinical, across the entire organization, we probably have 15 to 20 different groups going in. Uh, and that does play back to the politics that uh, you know, nobody wants to uh, admit that we're a shadow IT organization or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but uh, in the end, we are able to turn things around much quicker and it does create some tension, uh, as well as some you know, great opportunities to reduce costs across the entire uh, enterprise. Uh, one thing I will say across uh, the Hadoop plat platform, we've installed and worked with a lot of different technologies that are supposed to be sitting on top of Hadoop uh, and integrate well. Uh, my experience is that they don't always do that or they don't do it as expected. So when you're uh, rolling this out, plan some extra time for some of those uh, partner technologies to get the kinks worked out. Uh, internal expertise uh, and getting data from outside vendors, uh, it helps to have some internal expertise. Uh, my team knows the data sets inside and out. Uh, they work with them analytically. Uh, myself, for over 15 years, some of the people on my team tend to uh, 10 years plus. Uh, and we know the mistakes that data vendors uh, have or that CROs create so that we're looking for them up front and we know what to look for. Uh, and then in terms of expertise, uh, you do need some level of uh, Hadoop expertise, and we did bring in some outside help for that, but uh, it wasn't to the extent that uh, it was blowing out my budget in, in any way, shape, or form. So how did our analytical process uh, change? Uh, previously, we'd have to put together an analysis plan to justify the resources we were gonna have to throw it against it. Uh, we'd probably be limited to one data source, um, and then, you know, basically we would be scrambling to get it done for the, when the business wanted it a few weeks ago. Uh, and then to bring on new sources, it was months to, um, you know, if not years. Uh, after this, after we employed this, what we're looking at is, uh, you know, I can give you an example. Um, I had a business development deal across my desk uh, on Wednesday. Uh, I have to get them results uh, by uh, uh, Monday morning. Uh, it's a market we're not in, and I would have to load a completely new data set, probably about three to four of them, uh, complete a full uh, market analysis, look at the patient flows, uh, as well as uh, treatment patterns, find the physicians for market research, um, and we'll have no problem finishing that by probably uh, the end of day, uh, Friday, depending on uh, how much I work, I do well, I'm here. Um, the other thing is, uh, in the past, uh, we're purchasing data from a lot of different companies, whether that be uh, pharmacy data, medical data, claims data, all the identified. Um, and in the past, we would buy things and end up with uh, not what we expected. And these data sets are not inexpensive. Uh, what we're doing now is forcing the vendors to provide the data up front. We'll load it within a day, uh, evaluate it, uh, and then decide whether we want to buy it. So we're going in a lot more uh, eyes, on op eyes open in terms of what we're going to get and whether they're going to deliver on their promises. The other thing is piloting quickly. Uh, you know, we had a discussion this morning on uh, AI and other things. Uh, we're standing up machines and connecting uh, different data sources within days, which allows us to quickly pilot new technologies uh, as well as uh, additional analytics. So. Uh, I think right now, currently in our environment, we probably have three to four pilots going on testing new technology uh, or new data sources. To give you an idea of how the process worked previously, um, traditionally we would ask IT uh, to go out and uh, for an extract, uh, or we'd have to provide very detailed requirements. Uh, to be honest, most analytics people or business people don't have the time to provide requirements and uh, you know, aren't going to give it the time it probably deserves. Uh, that would continue on into looking at visualization, progression, and you know, spending about a half day on analysis. And that's really not ideal, especially when you look at how far analytics technology has come. Uh, you want to be able to spend a few days and a lot more iterations. Uh, and we're able to do that now a lot quicker, uh, as I mentioned in the example earlier. So in terms of personnel, um, it is key to making this work. Uh, you just can't have a full IT team, you can't have a full business team. There has to be some blend of, the, of both, uh, as you've been hearing throughout the day. 
Uh, you do need some in-depth understanding of the sources. Uh, yes, you can load data and uh, profile it very quickly, uh, especially with this technology. Uh, but in the end, you need to know what you're looking for. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't give access to people that uh, may have different views on it or uh, are inexperienced. But uh, you do need to have that base experience. Uh, adaptability. Uh, the technology we're using is changing every day. Uh, most of my people on my staff, I really don't care what they know right now, uh, as long as they're able to do their job. I care what they can do, like a year from now or how quickly they can change. Uh, in terms of IT support, um, we've had minimal success with our data warehouse people. Uh, to be honest, we very rarely use them. Uh, where we did use some expertise is uh, cloud and uh, security support. Um, I'm not a security expert. I do a lot in analytics, but uh, that's not my forte. Uh, and you need to make sure that's in place, especially in a regulatory, uh, regulated industry like mine. Uh, and then willingness to flex and adapt. Um, I think this is one of the key uh, contentions that you have a lot with the business is that uh, the business wants to move as fast as possible. They want to deliver on whatever their goal against and IT tends to want to control. Um, and if that's not, if IT doesn't flex enough for the business, I, I think we're at a point where with technologies like this, the business will go out and solve their own problem. So uh, there are additional benefits, both as technology and otherwise. Um, we can quickly onboard teams. Uh, since we've uh, deployed across the RWI and commercial groups, uh, we've brought two to three other teams across the organization in. Uh, generally, the onboarding process uh, for commercial it was probably two to three weeks. Uh, for other you know, uh, groups, it's been as low as a day. Uh, it allows broader uh, collaboration across the teams. Uh, before, we had everything siloed from uh, one commercial team here, uh, Japan would be somewhere else, uh, Europe would have their information somewhere else. Uh, and in most cases, uh, barring uh, regional privacy laws, you can have everything in the same place and a lot broader access. Uh, the other thing I would say about this technology, as I mentioned, we've had our challenges with our hosts. Um, the last time we switched hosts, uh, we were able to completely move everything over. Uh, I believe it was within a week. Um, and completely had to be stood up and uh, moving uh, and working with the data. And most of that was actually time moving the data and not platforming it. Uh, some of the other things that we're looking at uh, is new integrations. Uh, with all the information from different groups in the same place, we can actually uh, start looking at combining uh, lifestyle data with, say, um, electronic medical records or claims data uh, and other uh, different disparate sources that before we wouldn't have been able to do. Uh, and then in terms of asking new questions, uh, you know, you see a lot of releases from Watson Health and, and the uh, reason my group was originally established, uh, the new one that I'm, that I'm in, is that we never wanted to be in the situation where our customers had better information than us. And so we're putting this technology in place and starting to test a lot of these new um, algorithms and analytics so that we have uh, better information. We know what our products are. We know how they should be used appropriately, both for our patients uh, as well as our other uh, customers. Uh, and then looking down the road, um, this group that I'm in, uh, we are starting to look at combining uh, you know, medical record claims information with genomics uh, and at a broader scale. And the flexibility that's provided and the scaling that's uh, available makes this uh, a much uh, easier uh, endeavor going forward. The other thing that we have uh, quite a bit, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Stellis, uh, our main areas are transplant, oncology, uh, urology, uh, and oncology. Um, with a lot of the new imaging technologies, we're starting to get into much more unstructured data. Um, as well as uh, dealing with things like uh, non-Western uh, characters. Um, we are based in Japan, and uh, a lot of the other uh, tools that we were working with couldn't handle the uh, uh, non-Western characters. But we are starting to look at uh, loading images and uh, dictation and things like that that uh, 
you know, just traditional data warehousing couldn't handle. Thank you. Um, I think one of the things I'd like to just add to this was that I think what you're seeing and hearing from Chad is he's actually now got a platform and a process and a team in place and the organizational, high level organizational support to start moving in the directions that we were hearing about. So we were hearing you know, at the uh, credit union about end-to-end -end processes and going all the way from the, discover the building and getting the data ready through the analytics and then taking it to market and, and with all these uh, genomics where they're going. And now with the unstructured data, maybe more AI techniques. And f the speed with which you can find your data, pull it together and start working with it, eliminates that barrier of having to go get budget for every one of these projects and having to go get a project manager and requirements that actually you start with the data. You start seeing what you have, you, you, like you said, with your data vendors. I think you said there was a significant savings to be able to evaluate data before you committed to buying it. And, um, and so, you know, this agility, I think, is a harbinger of where um, I'm hoping data management and the role of data analytics goes in companies and how they are uh, moving on to these technologies and yet getting the governance and controls that are necessary for regulated business. So with that, we can take questions. Maybe this one's uh, to Chad. Um, I worked in the financial industry um, mm -hmm. for about 20 some odd years, um, uh, supporting a global business uh, and technology group. It's difficult in the speed in which uh, all the things that you talked about. Um, However, can you talk a little bit into maybe um, you know, what opportunities there are to work with IT organization? Obviously, they do have assets, you know, like the data warehouses and things like that, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which has gone through governance and you know, some reference data and maybe market data that's already been being sourced. Yep. So if you were to have a single view of the client or a single view of, uh, and, and so maybe you can kind of talk through, you know, working with them and how much, if you will, mm -hmm. because um, in the financial industry, the, the data lineage uh, and sort of who you worked with, <clears throat> including IT and, <coughs> excuse me, governance is kind of important in regulatory um, assertion of, you know, this is what we did and this mm -hmm. is how we did it. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a careful balance there and, and maybe your experience and how you kind of walk through that. And, and, and lastly, the question is, I think, uh, have, you, have you gone through the regulatory exam and was that process that you've done acceptable? Sure, I mean, it, there is a balance. Um, we're not gonna take something, bring it in the same day and throw it out to, you know, 2,000 sales rep. Um, the next day. There is some governance that needs to go around that and uh, controls to make sure that uh, regulatory rules are followed. And, and I think the where it starts splitting or where the divide becomes a little bit more clear is when you're using things for internal use and uh, analytics. That's not to say that the data lineage is there, that's there regardless. Um, you know, depending on which source, there's a lot of them I have to maintain full audit logs and uh, lineage across the board. Um, in terms of working with IS, uh, we do have IS oversight um, and that's worked well. Uh, part of the reason IS gave us the green light to build kind of the global project is um, our change control process, if I were to follow it um, the way it stands, uh, we follow a different version that we're mapping out, um, is 52 documents. So anytime I want to change a system uh, outside of my environment, I have to fill out 52 forms. Um, it, and I asked, looked at that and said, well, you guys need to be up and running quickly. Um, that's not gonna work. Um, so what we're trying to do is come back and say, okay, you've built that. Where are the gaps in the governance uh, that you probably should fill? And then how do we take that and apply that to the enterprise so we can get from um, 52 down to 10 forms or eight forms or whatever it is? Um, because our, our you know, documentation is all digital on the new platform and for, um, based on the industry we're in was largely paper. I'll also just add to the comment here about the, the idea of bronze, silver, and gold 
it applies to the security model. There are only certain users who are allowed to see the bronze data. And you need to use lineage to say, well, that gold data actually is part of the lineage going into this federal regulatory report. And, and so having that tracked, it's, it's trying to give up the either or. That you can have access to raw and imperfect data, you just have to be careful about how to use it. And Podium keeps in its metadata, it uses those as guardrails. So you can't even see data you're not supposed to be working with. It's, it's got encryption and obfuscation, all these other things that banks need because of this. And, and I want to make one other addition here, which is um, Chad is, I would say, on the extreme, extreme edge of, hey, this isn't working. I'm going to take my ball and go home. Most of our customers actually are using data lakes and this kind of technology as a bridge, really more replacing ETL than the warehouse. Because there's a huge amount of powerful and uh, appropriate technology that's great at serving up relational queries to users, and that's still going to be a big part of the business. But this this front end of it is anathema to Chad and his group because they can't have that long change request every time. Other questions? Yes, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm from Genentech and uh, in research, and so. Um, it sounds like you face some of the uh, same kinds of problems that we do. I'm curious, how do you, you said you were beginning to take medical records and, and uh, load them into your data lake. How do you deal with the imprecision of the information that you get going to a very highly precise scientific research kind of uh, area? How do you, how do, you do that? Because that's something we struggle with. For the medical data we have, mm -hmm. um, that's one of the challenges that we're actually going through right now. Okay. Uh, we're trying, one, to figure out exactly how we govern it because uh, yeah. it, you probably have the same challenges we do that you know we're changing case report forms halfway through a study and bringing things through, through. And the data lake does allow changing that fairly quickly and allowing that to go through. Um, our biggest struggle has been more on the um, regulatory and compliance side, getting them comfortable with, no, it's not a traditional data warehouse, but we're still providing the same level of uh, governance just in a different way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to be honest, it's not an easy conversation because you know, our, our industry is not fast to change. I mean, no. uh, we're not going to take risks if it means putting you know, a billion dollar product at risk. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah. So, my name is Shahar. I'm from Paxata. So, I'm on the solution developer side when I'm thinking of a lot of the problems that you and the type of solution that you offer. One thing that I'm curious about that I'm struggling with personally in Paxata as well, is the data exploration. So in this type of business, let's say, how do you enhance data exploration over Hadoop? So there, there are two kinds of data exploration that I just want to refine. One is um, understanding the data you have. Okay, so I'm going to probably just go back a couple slides for reference, but one of the things that we looked at when we were saying it's the first mile of data is that as you're bringing data in, it's coming from a crazy number of sources, semi-structured, unstructured, COBOL copybooks, and that sourcing needs to be able to land it down at the bottom in the storage system in a way that can be queried easily by regular query tools, whether they're the big data query tools or even commercial tools like Click and Tableau and those. And so what we did in this case is we said, aha, we are ingesting data in a massively parallel platform. And what we are going to do is do validation, encryption, formatting, and profiling all while the records pass through memory and, and land that information in a metadata repository you see on the lower left. And that is then searchable. So the minute you load data, you have not just the data available to query, but you have metadata like the top 10,000 values in a frequency distribution and numbers of nulls to see kind of what the raw data looks like. Because that's what we always felt like is people knew what they wanted that silver or gold to look like, but 
you, you didn't know what you were going to get. And in fact, we built technology to analyze a file and tell you what we think the structure is automatically, because sometimes you're sent a file with no metadata. And, and this was a point I just wanted to bring back, is that we felt that it was critical that metadata drove everything because the cluster technology and structure and every data swamp we've seen built is lacking structure. You can't find things. So, so that level of data understanding we built in so you could search and browse and see in a nice tabular grid the data, the fields, the operational metadata, the business metadata, and also you could interact and add to it. So that was, we call it crowdsourced metadata. So that as users use it, they say, hey, don't use this field. It's, it's out of date since XYZ. And in fact, we're building in the ability to enforce policies like that with rules engines going forward. There's another part of understanding what you have, which is more probably to, uh, to Chad, which is, okay, I kind of get the bronze data you landed here, and now I'm gonna try and join it. I might use some machine learning, or I might use some statistics or reports to understand the quality or you know, fit for use, which is outside the scope of our platform. That's where you use analytics tools against it. Do you have anything to add there? No, I think that's very, pretty accurate, and I think what the tool does is allow us to get to that point a lot faster. Okay. Uh, and identify the problems because there's nothing worse than getting through a load process, being halfway through an analysis, and you realize it wasn't loaded, loaded properly. Yeah, there's, it, and this is, for those of you who have not had hands on work with Hadoop, I call it Hadoop's dirty little secret, which is it doesn't handle dirty records or corrupted records in the middle of a file well at all. And what happens is it loads the data, you give it the schema, you run a query, you get an answer. The answer's wrong because it takes a string in a numeric field that's actually it's somebody's name, and it says, oh, that's not a number, it's a zero. It's a zero. I mean, this is really, if you, you're an analyst, you can rack your brains not knowing that. That's why we do all that analysis on the way in. So we know that at the fundamentals, you at least identify where those problems are. Um, the other thing I'll just mention that some of the agility here also comes from this metadata repository. So that metadata keeps track of all the users and their access rights which means when you get request to say split these access to these two businesses, they're not rebuilding files. They're updating metadata roles and accesses and groups. Um, when you get asked to, to load data, you have that kind of automation. And so our feeling was this early part of working with data, when you don't know what you don't know, um, if we could streamline that and inform it and then remember what you learned in this metadata would make a continuously accelerating process of making the data more and more usable. Other questions? Up front here, up in the back? Next. Okay. Yes, uh, my question's around going back to the bronze, silver, and gold. I understand there's, uh, from what you just described with the metadata, that there's some automation, but I, it kind of feels like there's also how you classify and there has to be a thought process of questioning that you talk to the business about and understanding. And my second part of that question would be around your performance considerations that go into that for querying. That's a good question. Um, these layers are, first of all, conceptual. To explain something about a macro data property, a, a macro data management process, that most business users don't understand, which is that there are degrees of maturity in data and degrees of fit. So, but there's nothing hard-coded in our product that has three levels. So in fact, what we do is we work with our customers to design these layers. Um, we have another customer with six layers. They call them level zero through five. Um, and Chad actually gives different names to this subject area and analytical data la set layers. And they have their own policies about whether it needs to be approved, whether it needs to be automated, whether there's certain validations that make it useful. So basically, we're a platform that allows you to configure it as opposed to setting policy for you. Um, and and that, that is a, a real good question. On the performance side, um, everything that we execute from this is it's a metadata driven. You find things, you put things together in a shopping cart, you check out, you do transformations. It generates native jobs that run down on, on one of these Hadoop distributions, which is why also we could move his entire platform in less than a week, because what we really did is move the metadata and just move the data over, and, um, and, and we actually could go to a different distribution of Hadoop, because we don't modify that at all. 
And then you get these benefits of performance from Hadoop. And there's um, improvements in in-memory calculations with Spark, parallel calculations with Tez and MapReduce and new paradigms there, as well as storage formats when we move them to what's called the Parquet format. You got about a tenfold compression in the data sets that freed up a lot of bandwidth. So there's, we are just trying to ride on the evolution of that open source code and generate the right code from our metadata. Other questions? So as a uh, so as a consumer of an enterprise data warehouse, most of our quality issues lie with uh, bad ETL code. Mm -hmm. um, so you were saying that Podium, I don't know if you said eliminates, but reduces the need for ETL. Can you describe a little bit more around that? Uh, it does not reduce the need for transformation logic. It, it reduces, um, it displaces some traditional ETL, um, ETL processes, so people actually offload the transformations from either the warehouse, which became very popular doing the push down optimizations, or from the native engines of Informatica or Abinitio. The, the issue that, we've, that we find interesting is that, first of all, we do a lot of profiling and analysis on the data on the way in. And this is actually against Hadoop philosophy, which is, oh, don't look at the structure until you need it, and then apply it and read it. And we're saying, how will we know if we loaded anything good? So we load it, and it ends up as files on Hadoop, because it's not really a database, but we've analyzed all the structures, and we can tell you which records are troublesome. And, and therefore, we have a lot of information about that to start with, and we can catch errors early. And I think that's often where the ETL problem comes in, is they're given a spec, but it's, a, it's not really accurate as to what they're gonna get. The other part is that we keep all the versions of the data. So we have 100% copy of the raw data, 100% copy of the maybe silver layer intermediate data and history, and then a 100% copy of the target data that you may be getting ready to load into the warehouse. So if you find a corruption there, you actually can go back to the data that generated it. It's not gone, which is what happens with ETL. All you're left with is the logic, and maybe you have the staging files somewhere. So in our product, you do create data flows. You can use either SQL, or you can use what we call prepare, which is a data flow graph to generate jobs that run natively on Hadoop or very fast. But all the logic and lineage is in that metadata, so you can go back and, and fix it later. Okay, I think we are just about out of time. Uh, we, Podium has a booth here. Chad will be around for a little bit if you guys want to talk. And thank you again for your time. <laughs>